Well, good evening. I'm hoping some of you are already gathering in. It's about a minute until 7, and uh, we're just about ready to start our study tonight of Mark. Chapter 7. Well, Ricky Honeycutt is watching, and John Bishop is watching. Oh, we got a number of people. Hi, Jessica. I see your own. <clears throat> Today was a good day here at my house. Yesterday, I'm I was. Uh, um, working all day on church stuff here in the study and didn't even get into my shop but today I got finished uh, early uh, kind of like this morning with my work here in the study and got to spend some time in my woodworking shop so it's it's uh, oh it's always fun when I get to do that it's good to see you all gathering in <clears throat> you would think with uh, with this coronavirus and all of us sort of staying home more these days that, uh, that things would be easier but it, it seems like it takes more effort to do the things that we do uh, than it than it takes normally so but it's uh it's awesome to be able to do something like a facebook live bible study i i enjoy doing this and i hope that you all are enjoying it as well i see seven o'clock coming up and i just wanted to mention a couple of things we mentioned and announced in in uh, worship on sunday morning that uh a ton of people responded to our poll and it showed that 809 people would be there the first Sunday. The safe distancing cuts your capacity way down to like 20 or 22 percent and uh, so everybody wouldn't fit into our four services so uh, we announced that we're starting two new services one uh, in the commons one in the sanctuary both of those at one o'clock and uh, you'll hear more about those services before we reopen. We don't yet know when we will reopen. Uh, our bishop has a task force uh, looking at reopening and, and their meeting is uh, is this Friday and she's hoping to get some guidelines out to us uh, very soon. So we'll, we'll, we'll get those guidelines and make sure that the plans that we've put together satisfy the guidelines and, and we'll be ready. We prepared a, or are, are preparing a video to show everybody what it's going to be like to wear a mask and do safe distancing and all those things when we come back and and we'll have that video to show in worship uh, maybe even this Sunday that, that's our target but again let me repeat we don't know when we'll be reopening I'm getting lots of texts and calls and emails from people because people are anxious to to uh, to get back to worshiping and seeing one another but uh, we just don't know yet we're gonna we're gonna be cautious and we're gonna be be uh, careful to do this in the safest way that we know how? Well, it's time to get started. It's 7.02. Good to see so many of you. Again, I'm going to invite you to make comments, answer questions, ask questions, use your comment field. And uh, if you see me staring at the, screen, at the screen with my mouth open, it probably means that I'm trying to read uh, your answer or your comment. The, the, the font is really small on those, on those responses. Last week, we covered chapter 6, and we didn't quite get to the end. But it, it makes it a little easier whenever I put announcements in our newsletter to say we're in chapter 7 than to say we're in 5 and 6. But we almost got to the end of 6. Just real quickly, I'll cover uh, a little bit of a review of chapter 6, that last part, and then we'll hit chapter 7, and hopefully we'll get through chapter 7 tonight. I want to ask this. Be thinking about how Jesus was received when he went home to Nazareth. <clears throat> Mark told us about that last week in chapter 6. So go ahead and be posting. How was Jesus received uh, whenever he uh, went home to Nazareth and, and went to the synagogue? In the meantime, I'll tell you that uh, a lot happened in chapter 6. Besides Jesus going back to Nazareth, he sent out the 12 to do ministry. He fed uh, 5,000 people. Uh, and the death of John the Baptist was, was kind of reiterated again uh, here in the Gospel of Mark. Mark had told us earlier about John being arrested 
Now John's been put to death. And all of that happened in chapter 6. Uh, somebody tell me how Jesus was received whenever he got to uh, whenever he got to Nazareth. He's coming home as as um, you, you would think he would be kind of the, a traveling hero coming back to a hero's welcome, but it wasn't exactly it wasn't exactly that way. Uh, yes, thank you. Michael Smith says Jesus was not believed. The people there at first were amazed as wow. Where did he get all this learning? Isn't this the carpenter? And then they said, isn't this Mary's son? We know his brothers and sisters. So they were too familiar with him. They weren't giving him credit uh, for being the Christ. And because of that, they did not have faith. Uh, it says that he could do very little in the way of miracles there because they just didn't believe. They didn't have faith. Uh, he moved on from Nazareth. And then I've already mentioned that he fed the 5,000 uh, when he sent the apostles out, he sent them out to do the, exactly the same uh, uh, the same ministry that Jesus had been doing himself. Uh, yeah, people are saying he was a local without honor. A prophet is not as honored except in his hometown. That was that was the reception that he got. Sadly enough, whenever he sent the apostles out. He was giving them hands-on training to do the work that he had been doing, preaching and teaching and healing. And uh, when it, we didn't get much in the Gospel of Luke about their return, but in another Gospel it tells us that Jesus celebrated because the apostles told him that everything that he had been doing, they had been doing as well. The Spirit was alive in them. Um, we, we saw the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, what what do we learn? What what do we take away from that story of Jesus feeding five thousand? And by the way, a lot of people will point out that uh, yeah, there were five thousand men, but there no doubt were women and children. So that crowd may have been fifteen thousand. Tremendous number of people that Jesus fed. Uh, do you remember what we what we take away from that story of the feeding of five thousand? Kind of what's the, the 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 value in it? What do we learn from it? Somebody put up a comment about that. <clears throat> One is the incredible power of God. Uh, Jesus, no doubt, is using God's power here as he multiplies the the fish and the loaves. Um, we talked about how one wrinkle, a twist on the story could be that people had food with them and when Jesus took the little boy's uh, meager lunch and broke that and shared it with some people that others may have done exactly the same thing and that too would have been a miracle. Uh, Darren says God is a miracle worker. Absolutely. We we see that and, and there was so much bread and, and food left over at the end of the meal there are 12 baskets full of leftovers. So there's God's awesome power is uh, is clear and represented in uh, that miracle. Uh, but that's uh, that's the most literal truth that's there. It's, it's absolutely true. But there's probably a more subtle truth there that, uh, that says that what we have oftentimes is adequate if we will turn it over to God, if we will ask God to take and bless and use what we have. When when Jesus said, uh, why don't you feed them? The apostles pointed out it'd take a ton of money. It'd be like a year's salary to feed all these people. And and Jesus immediately says, what do you have? Not Don't, don't tell me about what you're lacking. What do you have? Uh, yeah, Tom Sutherland mentioned this, that people may have been opening their hearts to feed others. But uh, <clears throat> they had resources. And uh, maybe it was just a few fish and a few loaves. We don't know. But it was enough. With God's help, it was enough. So that's a kind of a subtle point that we get from that as well. Jesus, uh, after feeding the 5,000, sent the apostles back across the Sea of Galilee in a boat. <clears throat> he goes up on the mountainside to pray. Uh, and while he's there, he looks down on the Sea of Galilee. It's late. 
and the wind is against them, and the apostles are struggling. Now they would have, they may have had a sail up, but they also would have been, uh, well, they would have been rowing, and with the wind against them, they're not making much progress. They're they're getting tired, and Jesus decides to come out and to, and to be with them, and he does that by walking on the water. Um, at first, they think he's a ghost, and he walks in and tells them, "Let's see." This is right at the end of chapter 6. It says they were terrified and he says he immediately spoke to them and said, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat, got in with them, and the wind died down. It says, it's interesting, it says they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. He had to be disappointed. Here they've just seen this phenomenal miracle and they're not getting it. They're not understanding just yet. Uh, on this walking on the water, there's no account of Peter coming out to walk with Jesus. But it says that when they got over across the Sea of Galilee to a place called <clears throat> Genesaret and anchored there, the people recognized Jesus. This is in the general area where Jesus had healed the man possessed by the demons. And the people were ready and prepared. I mentioned that earlier. The man he healed must have, have uh, done his work of witness because the people there were prepared to receive Christ. Now, Becky is with me again tonight, and she's going to read. Uh, say hi, Becky. Hey. She's going to be reading chapter 7, verses 1 through 8 first. So go ahead if you would. <clears throat> the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give <clears throat> their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Okay. You see this, uh, this uh, kind of uh, tension between Jesus and the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders. It, it's building. In an earlier verse it said they had even uh, plotted with the uh, followers of Herod to try to find a way to put him to death. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law, now remember, the Pharisees were these people who, they tried their best to be good people. They wanted to obey every rule. In fact, they thought the way to have eternal life was to earn God's love. And you earn God's love by following all of the rules. Uh, Jesus sounds pretty harsh in verse 6 when he calls them hypocrites. Uh, but keep in mind what's happening here. They really, really were hypocrites. No doubt the Pharisees and the teachers of the law had been sent out from Jerusalem to check out this rabbi, this teacher, who's teaching really without authority. He hasn't been sent. He's, he's, he has been sent. He's been sent by God, but not by humans. Uh, so, whenever they come, whenever they... they uh, Whenever they ask Jesus, I want you to think about this. How do these people come across when they go to Jesus' disciples and say to them, why do you not wash your hands? Or why do they, when they ask Jesus, why do your disciples not wash their hands before they eat? How are they coming across? And let me very, very quickly say, this has nothing to do with germs. It has nothing to do with hygiene. 
we we typically wash our hands before we eat, but it's so we don't get sick. We we know about 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 germs and things, and so we we want to be clean. But uh, one hand washing before a meal is plenty. These guys are not washing their hands because of germs. They're not washing their hands for health reasons. Uh, they're they're washing their hands for ceremonial reasons. So how do they come across when they say to Jesus, why do your disciples eat without washing their hands? How would you describe them as they do that? Um, yeah, somebody says maybe they're nitpickers. Yeah, they're judgmental. Yes, legalistic. Absolutely. Uh, they are... Uh, they are, yeah, Joanna Crook says, arrogant. They have come with their practices, their traditions. Ah, and somebody else, Becky Truex says, self-righteous. That's one of the really key problems of the Pharisees. Somebody said judgmental. They, had, they were keeping the law the very best they could. That is, that's honorable. But they had started looking down at others, uh, because others didn't keep the law as meticulously as they did. Pharisees wouldn't live in a community surrounded by other people. They, they pull themselves away. They would only live around other Pharisees because they didn't want, uh, they didn't want to be led astray. They were very, very self-righteous and very judgmental of others. They're being judgmental here. The reason that they do all their hand washing is for ceremonial reasons. Uh, to, it's about being spiritually clean. And some of this about cleaning their hands and dishes, it comes from the Old Testament, from Leviticus. And there was a good reason for it. We're going to talk about that, but they had totally overdone it. If you'd been in the marketplace, you might have touched uh, something, you might have touched a Gentile. Oh my goodness, somebody who was not Jewish by their very nature, was, quote, unclean. And so if you touch them, you became unclean. Uh, if a Gentile picked up a, an, uh, a piece of fruit in the marketplace, didn't buy it, but set it back down, and a Jewish person came along and picked up that piece of fruit, now they've become unclean. And when you're unclean, it means you can't go to worship if it was time to go and do the sacrifice at the temple. You can't do that. You have to go and offer prayers, sacrifices, and go through a, a real a laborious ritual to become ceremonially clean. So it was a big deal to never be declared unclean. Uh, even if uh, an unclean Jewish person had picked up that apple, looked at it, put it back down, and then the uh, Pharisee picked it up, he becomes unclean. So they're all wrapped up in this. Uh, the, the, the laws about clean and unclean in the Old Testament had started with laws about clean and unclean meat. Now, God had said to the Israelites, the children of Israel, as they were traveling through the Exodus and as they come into the Promised Land, here are the animals that you can eat. Here are the animals you can't eat. Uh, part of it had to, and, and they would describe animals with cloven hooves like a cow. Uh, and then they would, but okay, okay, pigs have cloven hooves, okay? Meaning their, their hooves are like this. They're it's split apart. A horse's hoof is solid like this. Horse meat, unclean could only eat the meat of an animal whose hoof was split, cloven. But wait a minute, it also had to be a, an animal who chewed its cud. You know, a, a cow swallows grass, it's only partially digested. Uh, they kind of burp it up and they chew it again. That makes the cow clean. Beef was okay. Pigs don't do that. They were unclean. <laughs> so now you have to know all of this stuff about animals, know what's clean and unclean. The reason God gave the Israelites the food laws was really to keep them separate. God wanted them to be a special separated people so they couldn't eat. In the Eastern culture, sitting down and eating with someone 
is how you have companionship and friendship. If you can't eat with them in, in their culture, you really couldn't be close to them or friends with them. And God wanted the Israelites, for the time being, to be separated. And so he gave them the food laws. But then also he gave them laws about their being clean and unclean. They're, they were traveling in groups of hundreds of thousands. And when someone got a skin disease, you had to be really careful because it was contagious, so God gave them laws. Man, these diseases, these things about washing your hands and diseases, it's sounding too familiar here with us with this COVID-19, isn't it? But uh, the Leviticus is full of rules about how you, how you do all this stuff and stay clean. But the Pharisees, bless their hearts, they come along, learned all of that that was in Leviticus and some other parts, Deuteronomy of the Bible, and then they had added what's called the oral tradition. It's like they, they added to it. And so when a, when a Pharisee sat down to eat, they washed their hands and used the water all the way up to their elbows and then held their hands out for the water to drip off, uh, thinking the water was now unclean. Oftentimes, Pharisees would wash their hands seven times during the meal. Uh, so they, they were totally over the top. Uh, so now, whenever they ask about the apostles' practices, who are they really asking about? When they say, Jesus, why do your disciples not wash their hands? Are they really asking about the disciples? Not really. Who are they really asking about? Who's the judgment about here? Good to have Dan Young watching with us. Dan lives over in Pikeville, Tennessee. <clears throat> Good to have you, Dan. Whenever they ask about the practices of the disciples and being judgmental of the disciples, they are being judgmental about Jesus. Because as Jesus' disciples do, uh, that's what helps people to form their opinion about Jesus. Uh, that reminds me uh, of an interview that I saw in Disciple Bible Study. Um, yeah, a number of you now are answering, uh, Jesus, thank you, Jesus himself. Uh, I can't remember if it was Disciple 1 or Disciple 2, but uh, I think it was Disciple 2, Rabbi Randall Falk who was the rabbi of a synagogue, a huge synagogue over in Nashville, was interviewed about uh, Christianity. And I'll never forget, now here's this Jewish rabbi, and someone says, Rabbi, what do you think of Jesus of Nazareth, whom we think of as Jesus the Christ? And the rabbi said this, You know, it depends on how Jesus' followers treat me. If I'm treated with, with hatred or, or uh, anti-Semitism or, or injustice, then I think that must be the way Jesus is. But if I'm treated with love and compassion and, and fairness, then I must think that Jesus is that way. So a lot of how I view Jesus depends on how I view his disciples, those who follow him. Folks, that's a, that's a valid judgment, and it's something that we as believers carry with us. That's part of our witness. We are to live so that we bring honor and glory to our Lord. Uh, Jesus gave uh, uh, another example of how they were allowing their oral traditions, their, these added rules, uh, by people to trump God's commandment. Uh, God says that, what, what is it that the law, the commandments say we're to do to our mother and father? In fact, there's a commandment. Blank thy mother and father. What are we to do with our parents? In accordance with God's teaching. And, and by the way, the commandments, they're not ceremonial rules that kind of came, served their purpose, and moved on. The, the commandments, those are moral laws, and they still are in effect. They Jesus said, I didn't come to, to uh, change or take away any of those. So what were we supposed to do with our parents? In fact, he's going to get into this in verses uh, 
9 through, looks like about uh, 13. Yes, we're to honor. Honor our, our mother and father. Honor our parents. People are giving me that answer. Instead of honoring their parents, uh, the Pharisees had come up with this little deal when they would say, okay, I've got some additional money here, and this money has become, the word is korban, korban, C-O-R-B-A-N, korban. So, now that this money is korban, it's like it's designated to be used uh, for God's purposes. Maybe I'll contribute it at the synagogue, or maybe I'll give it in, uh, in an offering at the temple, and mom and dad, you know, I'm sorry. I know I was, tradition is that we're, you're supposed to live with me and I'm supposed to support you now that you're old enough that you can't work. But all the money that I would use to support you is Corban. I'm sorry, you're out on the street. So Jesus used that example to say, you've made up these rules and that's the way human beings are. When we start making the rules, we can kind of go crazy. And he says, you've made up these traditions and thus, in verse 13, he says, You nullify the word of God, honoring your father and mother, by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Now, that had to have really made them angry. He's holding up a mirror so they can see how their actions, even though they've got rules that allow them to do it, they're oftentimes wrong. Becky, you up to reading again? Sure. Verses 14 through 23. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you... Are you so dull, he asked. I love that. Ooh. <laughs> Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within... Out of a person's heart that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Okay. Um, Jesus is continuing on this thing about... Uh, clean and unclean. Um, they had this thing about, uh, you know, if it, was a, if it was a metal container and it uh, somehow got touched by a Gentile, you could clean it. There was a way to clean it. But if it was pottery, <laughs> it's kind of like that unclean that gets down in the pores. You couldn't clean it. You had to break it. You had to throw it away. And all of these rules. Uh, and Jesus is saying, wait a minute. It's, uh, it's, it's nothing, nothing outside uh, can make us uh, can make us unclean. It's what's on the inside that counts. I would say that these people, the Pharisees, are being very religious, but they're not being faithful. In other words, they're all about keeping the rules. If you listen to our culture today, you'll hear people say this in a little different way. Oftentimes, people today will say, I'm not part of any church. Uh, I am spiritual, but I'm not religious. Uh, for some of them, this means they're seeking a spiritual relationship with God outside the organized church. And they're accusing the church of being religious without necessarily being spiritual. That's that's a kind of an incriminating thing. Uh, Sometimes people use that as an excuse to say I'm spiritual but I'm not religious, meaning I don't want to go to church, I don't want to do the things that, uh, the practices that Christians do. But there's enough of a, of a point to that that we have to be careful in the church that we don't ever become 
like these Pharisees, like these teachers of the law, where we're just about keeping rules rather than uh, being in relationship with Christ. Jesus uh, explains his saying when he says, it's not what goes into a person, but what comes out that makes a person unclean. Why does he explain that? He's going he's gonna to give us some further explanation here. Uh, but why does he do that? Look at verse 17. I said at the very beginning of this study on Mark that one of the characteristics of the Gospel of Mark that's a little different than Matthew and Luke is that Mark doesn't always uh, paint the disciples in the most positive picture. Uh, he's very honest and sometimes almost brutal with the way they're just regular people. Uh, and they didn't get it. Uh, yeah, to show, he, he's explained it again so they get it. In fact, Becky laughed whenever she read that. Uh, he seems a little annoyed, doesn't he? He goes, man, are you guys so dull? Uh, do you not get this? Come on, you got to get with me. Uh, he's, he's a little annoyed with them. It reminds me a little bit of the parable of the soils, where he, you know, a farmer goes out to sow seeds, and he talks about the four different kinds of soils, and then he goes in the house, and the apostles say, uh, uh, what do you mean by that? What's the... There's got to be more to this than talking about seeds and thorns and rock and, and sun. And, and so he explained it this time when they ask. It's a little bit like he's getting impatient with them. Come on, guys, get with it. Uh, but he does. He goes on and explains to them, uh, somebody touching something that a Gentile's touch, that doesn't make you uh, unclean or unfaithful or anything like that. Uh, yeah, Patricia says he wants the inward uh, soul to be faithful, not an outward show. Exactly. All this hand washing, all this uh, washing of cups and, and all that stuff, that's an outward show. You're exactly right. He wants there to be an inward change, uh, a change of the heart. Um, most dramatically, as Mark explains in parenthesis here, Let's see what verse uh, we're, we're at. Yep, at verse 19. In parenthesis, Mark says, In saying this, Jesus declared, All foods clean. Oh, ho, go get your bacon. It's all right. It's, uh, there's no unclean food. Uh, if you listen, um, th that, that is a really important point that's just going to make... Uh, the Pharisees more upset. What does make us unclean? Jesus says it's the things that come from our hearts. When we're harboring in our hearts wrong thoughts, wrong motives, then bad actions come from those impure hearts. It's not what we take in that makes us unclean. It's what's in our heart and comes out of our hearts. Uh, it seems as if Jesus is saying to, to the Jewish people that the food laws have served their purpose. Okay? The, there's no unclean food. He's saying it's all good. You can eat it. Uh, they've helped Israel to learn to obey God. The food laws have. They've helped to keep Israel separate to become a nation unto themselves. Now that's done. Now their Messiah has come. The purpose for the children of Israel to be separated, that purpose has been met. Now Christ is among them. Jesus will say dozens of times, the kingdom of God is at hand. I'm among you. Here I am. Uh, so the people, the Jewish people, are no longer bound by those food laws and all those laws about clean and unclean. I read the other day a really good analogy of this. The food laws. Can eat pork, you can eat beef. Uh, can eat this kind of seafood, can eat that kind of seafood. Can eat a horse, cannot eat a horse, okay? Those food laws uh, 
were like signposts on a journey. Turn left here. One way. Don't go here. Stop. Wait for the traffic to pass through. Uh, yield. Those are all signposts. Or 15 miles to, to uh, Knoxville. Those signposts are really, really important when we're on the journey. But when we arrive at our destination, the signs don't mean anything. They're no longer useful. The kosher food laws, the, all the, the ceremonial laws about hand washing and all those things, they were important while the Israelites were growing into this separate nation, the children of God. But now that Christ has come, he is the end of the journey. He is, God has fulfilled the prophecy in the coming of the Christ and all those signposts along the way are just no longer needed. Uh, the Pharisees, again, were very meticulous in following the rules, but they were not faithful, they were not loving, nor were they accepting. Um, I mentioned earlier, and I have to say it again, the, the, the problem for us is that we can get hung up in appearances. Somebody said it. Uh, it's what's on the inside that really counts. It's not what's... Uh, it, it's not this visible stuff that... Now, don't get me wrong. What we do, serving others, uh, acting out our, our, our faith, that's really, really important, but it's not done for show. We, we read earlier the scripture where Jesus says, wait, wait a minute, when you light a candle, you don't put it under a bowl, or you don't put it under the bed. Uh, some scriptures say under a table. No, we, we take it and we set it on the table so it can give off its light. But its light is... Uh, Air witness showing forth the love, the light of Christ. It's not doing things for show. Uh, and, and here, what the Pharisees were doing and what we can get caught up in doing, I've probably said Pharisees enough because uh, whenever, we, whenever we look at Scripture, remember, we're not looking through a window at other characters. We're looking at a mirror that's held up and you say, ooh, I see David in that. I've been a little bit like a Pharisee today. I've been judgmental. I've been all hung up in the rules and not on my relationship with Christ. Thinking we can earn our salvation. Uh, so wrong. Doing good works so God will love us. So wrong. Uh, serving on church committees uh, in order for God to love us or so we can, can receive salvation. Tithing. None of those things. are. They're all good things but they're not done in order to receive salvation. They're done because we have received salvation, because God loves us and we want to live out our faith. Comparing ourselves to others and judging them, such a, such a, a common thing to do that we have to guard against. So the Pharisees, those stories are there to help us sometimes see our nature and see that it's, it's wrong and we won't do that. Uh, Mark 7, 24 through 30. How about reading that one for me? Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. <clears throat> Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Wow. This is a, in, in a way, it's kind of a strange story. Now, this woman, a Syrophoenician woman, uh, uh, Phoenicia was up along the Mediterranean sea coast of Israel. Um, and so Syrophoenicia would have been way up on the northern part. In fact, it mentions Tyre, that uh, that town is way up on the northern coast, uh, western, northwestern coast of Israel. 
He entered the house and didn't want anybody to know it. It's kind of like he's trying to get away. Crowds are just all over Jesus. And so he goes in to get a little peace and quiet. Uh, yet he could not keep his present secret. And as soon as he settles down in the house, here comes this woman who says her daughter has an evil spirit and she wants Jesus to heal her. Now, it's really, really important that we notice this woman is Greek. She is not Jewish. And this sets up this whole intercourse between her and Jesus. He's going to have this discussion with her. And he sounds a little harsh. There's no way around this. Uh, I, I've read in commentaries where uh, sometimes Bible scholars... It's, it's kind of like they, they want to soften it a little bit or they want to they want to make it sound more logical. Uh, I, I think Jesus was a bit harsh with her for a reason. Uh, this woman comes and whenever she says, would you heal my daughter? She doesn't ask that theoretically. Uh, she's not asking this hypothetically. She's desiring that her little girl be healed and she has faith. She believes or she wouldn't go to the trouble to come and to ask. She doesn't just ask. She begged. Uh, in, in other words, it's like, you can do this. I know you can do it. Please do it. And Jesus said, First, let the children eat all they want. For it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Oh, the dogs. Uh, I read in one commentary, a really good commentary, a wonderful work, the writer says, you know, the Greek word that, that's used there by Mark is not the dogs that walked on the street and were mean and thought of bad. This is a little house dog. <laughs> and what, what the commentator is trying to say is almost like, I can't feed the, the children's bread to a puppy. You know, it's, it's like he's trying to soften it. But notice this woman has a brilliant answer. She sees that the Jewish people aren't eating the bread that's been brought to them. They're dropping it on the floor. And she uses the analogy. Jesus started it by saying, I've got to let the children eat. I can't feed the children's bread to the dogs. And she says, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Wow, the children are being wasteful. They're dropping it. They're not all accepting Christ. And that's what she's referring to. And Jesus sees the beauty of her answer. There's enough for everyone, isn't there? For such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And she was. This is one of those cases. There will be others. This is one of those cases where Jesus ministers to Gentiles. Uh, in, the, in the closing verses of this chapter, uh, I told you all we'd get through chapter 7 today. We're going to make it. We're, we're going to really be on a chapter a week here soon, starting next week. Uh, Verses 31 through 37 tells about Jesus healing a man who is deaf and mute. It takes place, and it says Jesus left Tyre and went through Sidon, which is also on the western coast of Israel, and went to the eastern coast, the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of the Decapolis. Remember what happened in the Decapolis. That's the ten cities. It was in one of those ten cities that are near one of those where Jesus healed the man who called himself Legion. And the, the, all those evil spirits went into the herd of pigs. When Jesus arrived there, he saw a man who was deaf and mute. Jesus took him aside, away from the crowd. What Jesus is about to do is personal. Uh, and and he's, he's protecting this man's privacy. He put his fingers in the man's ears then he spit and touched the man's tongue. You go, whoa! You keep in mind, in those days, people thought saliva had healing power. At one point, Jesus takes saliva, mixes it with dirt, and makes mud, and, and, uh, and heals a blind person. After he touched the man's tongue, he looked up to heaven and said, Epithatha, which means be opened. And the man's ears were opened, his tongue loosens, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But as soon as he does that, don't tell anybody about this, what are they going to do? They immediately go and tell. It says the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf 
hear and the mute speak. Uh, remember, the Decapolis is a Gentile area. Decapolis means ten cities in Greek. And most of those cities were started when the Greeks were occupying Palestine. They were taken over by the Romans. And those ten cities, uh, much of them are still there today. Some of them are in ruins. But here Jesus is in a Gentile area immediately after his ministry with the Syrophoenician woman. That's no coincidence. Mark is making a point that Jesus came for everyone. Uh, this, this whole thing uh, about no longer is the kosher food. Do you have to worry about kosher food? It's all clean. Jesus is also showing us through his actions all people are clean. There is no Jew or Gentile uh, as far as spirituality is concerned. It would take the apostles a while to learn this. Some of you remember the story in the book of Acts where Peter, uh, after Jesus' ascension, had someone come and, well, just before they, someone came, just before they arrived, he saw this vision of a blanket coming down from heaven and on it were all kinds of animals some clean sheep and calves that he could eat, others pork and other animals that were unclean. And a voice said, kill and eat, Peter. And Peter says, I can't, but there's, there's unclean animals on this. And the voice, the message was repeated. And Peter says, I can't. You know the food laws. Lord, I, I can't eat this. all of these animals. And the voice again said, kill and eat. And just as he was having that vision and wondering, what does this mean? It's all good. I created it all. You can eat any of this. There was a knock at the gate. And here were these two men who had come down from a centurion, a Roman, who was asking Peter, come, share the good news with us. And Peter realized when that happened, the vision had been to tell him all people are clean. It doesn't matter if they're Jewish or Roman uh, Jewish, Gentile, all are God's children. And when Peter went and, and minister or preached the good news to that household, the centurion and his whole family, everyone in the household, accepted Christ. Uh, barriers were being broken down. But that started not with Peter, not with Paul. That started with Christ. And Mark is telling us here, Christ really did come for us all. Guys, we're out of time. In fact, I have gone two minutes over, and I still have as many people as I started with. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Next Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, we will do uh, chapter 8. And I know a lot of you, you're on tonight, those of you who are watching Facebook Live, but during the week, uh, this is posted on our website, and a lot of people are watching this later. And I really appreciate that as well. Thank you, no matter what time or when you're seeing this study. It's good to have you. God bless you. You all have a good evening. Bow with me if you would. Let's close with prayer. Gracious God, thank you for opening your word to us. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to bless us and to help us not just to understand with our heads, but to learn with our hearts. Your word always wants to change us. Help us to be open to that change. Give us tonight a good night's rest and tomorrow help us find ways to be your loving witnesses. In Christ's name, amen. God bless. Good night.